Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Audio Signals podcast. I have to say that I kind of changed the way that I I I log into the platform for recording lately. I was just thinking about this. When when you start doing podcasts, which has been a few years now, you had that pressure to say, oh, I have to do this podcast. You know, there's always a little bit of nervousness before you get on and like, oh, do I sound, oh, how am I going to sound and is the conversation going to be great? After such a long time doing this and especially with Audio Signal podcasts where we talk about stories, my attitude is I'm going to sit down with somebody that I never met before most of the time and I'm going to listen to a great story. And because I <laughs> talk to storytellers, it's pretty much a guarantee. Um, some stories are better than other and, uh, but overall, I always walk away with something, something that enrich, uh, my imagination, it enrich my knowledge. And, uh, I have a good feeling that this is going to be one of those, as I always say, we're all made of stories. And I know that Barry, Barry Finlay, which is here on the show with me, he has, uh, he has a few in the pocket. He has a few in the books. Um, he has some that he, he lived, um, talking about climbing a very tall mountains. And I don't want to give away more than that, so I want you guys to stay tuned and, uh, and just have Barry uh, introduce himself and say hello. And uh, Barry, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Marco. It's uh, great to be here. It is great to have you. I already kind of read a little bit of a story about you in your bio, but I'd like to start with my first question, which is, who is Barry? And you can get as philosophical as you want. <laughs> okay. Well, I was, uh, I was born in central Canada and uh, raised on a farm there. I was, uh, I guess I was driving a truck when I was 12 years old and driving the tractor in my teens. And, uh, but by 18 years of age, I decided this wasn't for me. So, uh, I moved into the, the big city and uh, got my accounting designation. I uh, ended up working for the Canadian federal government for 31 and a half years, I guess, and uh, retired. And then that lasted for maybe uh, six months or something. And I got bored and started consulting and uh, ended up consulting for 10 years. So, um, but during that time, I, uh, I went to the doctor for a physical and and he told me my triglyceride levels were elevated. And I wasn't sure what that meant, so I asked him, and he said, well, it could lead to heart attack or stroke. And so uh, I took him at his word, and on the way home, I signed up with a personal trainer who turned out to be a, a, a woman of 21 years of age, and uh, she thought I should be able to do everything she could do. I was uh, I was approaching 60 at this time. And uh, so for the first few sessions I uh, had to sit in the change room with my head between my knees to try and will myself not to throw up but uh, over time I started to feel better and, and I was approaching my 60th birthday and and uh, started to wonder what I could do with my newfound energy and uh, better feel, feeling I lost 28 pounds during that time and um, and felt tremendous so our son had talked about climbing Kilimanjaro uh, a couple of years before, I guess, and I guess it kind of stuck with me. So I asked him if he'd be interested in going, and uh, he had a, a one-year-old daughter at the time, so he had some interesting conversations, I assume, with his wife. And uh, anyway, he ended up saying yes. So off we went to climb Kilimanjaro, and that, that kind of led to, well, when we were first talking about it, we looked for a book that would actually take you up the mountain and couldn't find any at that time. And so when we came back and started doing presentations, we realized there was an interest. And uh, so we wrote a, wrote a book about it, about the climb. And that has led to, uh, I guess, 10 more books since then. I'll be publishing my 11th on uh, September 3rd. So, um, so yeah, my life changed completely. I consider Kilimanjaro and Beyond to be a life-changing experience. That's the name of the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it certainly was, in my, in my opinion. So the, the question for me, and I have many, of course, that's my job, but the first one is, okay, you go uh, from a career where you probably sit 
a lot and you're not in the best shape of your life you you you, you, you lose weight you, you find the energy then your son says he didn't say let's go for a hike you know in the wood <laughs> right. nearby ottawa <laughs> right he said right. let's go to kilimanjaro so my, my my question is you guys must have had experience uh in climbing before or you don't just wake up and go to kilimanjaro <laughs> well we kind of did <laughs> <laughs> I, wow, okay, I, uh, that, that's the story right there. <laughs> I, I had no experience in climbing whatsoever. Whoa. Uh, I had, like, I'd done some athletics, obviously, uh, growing up, and and hmm. uh, our son was involved in soccer and uh, CrossFit and um, uh, obstacle course racing and things like that. But he hadn't really done any climbing either. And so... Uh, why we decided to do that looking back i'm not quite sure why we uh, chose kilimanjaro other than we had uh talked about it a little bit and the seed had been planted in my head i'd always had an interest in mountains mm. i um my aunt took me through the rocky mountains when i was 12 and i was fascinated by mountains then and then when i was in my 20s i saw a presentation by laurie Skreslet, who was the first canadian to climb mount everest and uh, I was just fascinated by that. So I think I always had this fascination with mountains. And uh, we did a lot of research before we decided to go to see if it was something we could really accomplish. And uh, there was still some question. Uh, Kilimanjaro or any mountain of that size is a bit of a crapshoot, whether you're going to make it or not. And it's got nothing to do with, with age or it has some to do with uh, your physical condition, but it has a lot to do with your the way you're going to adapt to the altitude. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't know that going in, and nobody does. They don't know how they're going to adapt mm -hmm. to that kind of altitude. Mm -hmm. um, but as it turned out, uh, our son had a bit of a tougher time than I did. He was 30 at the time uh, and in pretty good shape. But the altitude affected him worse than it did me. And so it's just... Uh, it's, I guess, how your metabolism uh, reacts to it. I had some altitude sickness, but not to the extent that he did. So, but uh, to answer your question, why we chose to climb a mountain instead of going for a hike, uh, I'm not sure I can answer that. <laughs> well, I think I could answer, but I'm probably, uh, my, my first thing, my first thought, actually, is Kilimanjaro has, has been in so many movies, it's been in many books, it's been like so many adventures, it's, it's beautiful. I don't think, for what I know, I'm not a climber, but I don't think it's as technical as many other mountains, right. as you said, you can, but you know, it's still a challenge. So uh, I, I just love that you said, yeah, let's just do it. So, yeah. and, and then you put all of that into, into a book. Yes, it is considered a hike. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a... Uh, like you don't need uh, ropes and ladders and things like that. And if we needed ropes and ladders, I wouldn't have gone because I'm, I'm right. not crazy about hikes and heights in the first place. So, um, but it is it is a hike and uh, it's a challenge though, right? It's definitely a challenge. It's nineteen thousand feet. Yeah. So uh, and the last six hundred feet or so are are a killer, but uh, but we made it. So. Uh, and it was just a fantastic experience. Very cool. So uh, at the beginning of the, your bio, you say something that reminded me of uh, <clears throat> Dory's character in, uh, in Finding Nemo. Yeah. Just keep swimming, except you said just keep climbing. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think that refers metaphorically not just to the mountain, but I, I'm assuming life in general. Yeah, a couple of things about that. Um, we were hiking, I think it was, I'm not sure, day six or seven, I think. And we were hiking along. We'd been hiking for about 12 hours already, and everybody was just beat. And uh, our son, Chris, was at the back of the, the line. And he said, just keep swimming. Yeah, and he there was, you go. He was, re <laughs> he was referring to uh, the movie. I and so that. I thought about that when we came back and came up with the, the motto that, Every mountaintop is within reach if you just keep climbing. Yep. And my most recent book, in fact, is uh, a nonfiction uh, called Just Keep Climbing. And it kind of, it came along, uh, I guess, 15 years or 14 years. But 
uh, I interviewed eight inspirational people and kind of incorporated my own uh, life into the book uh, 12 years later, 14 years later, and, uh, and included their stories. And uh, each one of them, in my mind, has kept climbing because some of the, the stories are, uh, some of the things that have happened to them are pretty significant and they've come out the other side. And uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I've written and based, I've written the book based on the, on the motto, just keep climbing. Right, right. All right. So let, let's get into the storytelling. From what I understand, uh, you haven't written before the climb. I mean, you had another job. I'm sure like every job involves writing, but you know, not maybe creative writing. And uh, then you, you wrote several books, but seems to me your creative uh, path, it's brought you to mystery writing. Um, yes. How that come about and what's the connection with that life changing experience and actually going to go write about that? Yeah, I did actually write uh, as part of my career. I spent about 10 years writing financial policy. Okay. And well, nobody reads financial policy unless they have to, but. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Still writing. I, uh, yeah, I think it honed my writing skills and mm -hmm. uh, made me a better writer for sure. Um, and, and so I wrote the two nonfiction books. There was one called I Guess We Missed the Boat, which was uh, based on our travels. I traveled uh, quite a bit with my in-laws. So uh, so there were some humorous stories that came out of that. Um, and then it, I decided I wanted to challenge myself. I'm, as I said earlier, I'm an accountant, I think. And uh, I, already, I think I said it, but um, I'm an accountant. So accountants aren't necessarily supposed to be that creative and uh, just by definition. And so I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could write a thriller at that time. And um, so I uh, based the character on a mild-mannered accountant, which, uh, uh, and then that developed into a series of five books. But that was the reason I, I decided to write, uh, to go into the thriller or mystery genre, was basically just to challenge myself and see if I could do it. And um, it turned out okay. And uh, so I've continued on from there. So you like that genre? Did you grow up reading that? Because usually I did. A, I did, yes. a lot of writer, you know, they're like, you got to read a lot to write a lot. Yeah, or, yeah. I, so. I, I do like that genre and I still like that genre. I still, when I read, I read a little bit of everything, but definitely more thrillers and uh and mysteries than anything else and um you know that gives me ideas of, uh, of where to go and i i, I, th I find myself now paying more attention to the writing than to the plot mm. so i i'm looking at, at how they're delivering the story how the author is delivering the story as opposed to the story itself mm. so in some ways maybe it's taken the enjoyment out of reading a little bit <laughs> I don't find myself reading as much as I used to, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm focusing on something different than I used to before I started writing. Okay, I can see that, but uh, I kind of have that with with movies, and that's because mm -hmm. you know my wife is involved with that industry, and and I know now what I didn't know before, like how long it takes to do a scene, what they're doing there. And so I, I yeah. started like pointing out continuity and uh, <laughs> because she did for many years. And now I'm like, but I, I maybe I appreciate even more the, the craft. Um, yeah. Right. So maybe you don't get too involved or as involved in the story, but you do appreciate it. I think from a more different angles. Am I Absolutely. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and different authors have different styles. So it's, it's interesting to see how the different authors uh, pull their subject matter together. Yeah. And tell me uh, about your style. Are you a plotter? Or are you do you write I, out of your, you know, do I've you tried the character go what what will you do? Yeah, I've tried plotting. Um, I can't do it. <laughs> I've, uh, <laughs> I think, um, I suppose I'm a bit of a hybrid because I plot maybe two or three chapters ahead. 
Mm. I don't write it down. I uh, kind of plot it out in my head, and I know I know where it's going. But I find the characters take me in directions that I never expected, and the story takes me in directions that I never expected. And that, for me, is is one of the joys of writing. Uh, and I really don't know how it's going to end until it ends. So I'm, um, you know, I always look forward to finishing a book to see how it ends when I'm writing it. But um, no, I, I uh, like I said, I've tried to plot and uh, I just can't because I just, and, and what I did try and plot, I found the characters and the storyline still took me in a different direction than I expected. Mm-hmm. So I would have to sit down and replot. So there's no point in that for me. You know, I, I might as well just sit there and write and, and see where it goes. And I, yeah. I admire people who can plot because I think it probably, uh, it probably makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to write the book if you've got the basic outline. Then there, then you're kind of filling in the blanks. But uh, it's just not for me. It's just not something I can do. I've spoke with both um, people that really plot everything. People that have the beginning and the end, and then they know that they have to, like a, one of the podcasts that it would have been it would be already published once i publish yours because it's a past conversation but it's not uh, live at the time of this conversation he, he created he creates world kind of like talking and you know it, it's all fantasy uh yeah and uh so he he starts with mapping and then he connected all the dots yeah. And uh, in other, they're more like you. And I feel like it's kind of like in everything in life. I feel like um, in a profession, you always admire people that can do it different from you. And I think that people that don't plot, they wish they could plot a little bit more. <laughs> and, and, and writers yeah. actually just leave their characters go and maybe they wish. And maybe the truth is in, in the middle. Right? Yeah, yeah, it could be. And I find I have to uh, keep track of my characters and their characteristics and stuff like that uh, yeah. so I don't get all that confused because I've written a five-book series now uh, yeah. called the Marcy Kane Thriller Collection. And then I'm working on the Jake Scott Mystery Series, and I'm releasing the third book in September. And uh, so I have to keep the characters uh uh, in check. Yeah, I keep track of the characters and, <laughs> and uh, you know, make sure that they don't have brown hair in one book and uh, right. and black hair in another book or something, you know. Unless they are a shapeshifter in that case. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite gone there yet. Tell me tell me about uh, your characters and, and, and why is for you, did it come easier to, to just develop the same character over and over. I mean, it's pretty common and I'm not saying it is easy for everyone, but because some people just want to write a book, get done with it and then go with a completely new story. Um, how do you feel yeah. about your character and yeah. why do you assume you, you like it so much that you keep writing about it? Yeah. And my, my first uh, series I came up with, there were actually two, main character. So it was Marcy Kane, who was a very independent, uh, divorced woman who was a little bit sarcastic and, and sometimes um, did things irrationally and got herself in trouble as a result. And there was the mild-mannered accountant, whose name was Mason Seaforth. And uh, the two of them get together in the first book and uh, and well, uh, Mason's wife disappears on the night of their 20th anniversary. So he gets into her computer and finds some things there that uh, he hadn't been aware of. And uh, so he enlists the help of Marcy Kane, who is his wife's best friend, to help him out. And at the end of that book, I could have gone in two different directions. I could have run with Mason Seaforth, mild-mannered accountant, or I could have run with Marcy Kane. The next book was um, called A Perilous Question, and it's about two young girls from Africa who uh, end up, well, one of them asks, so when are you taking me to America? And she asks the wrong person, he ends up taking them. So it's a human trafficking story. And I thought Marcy Kane fit better with the story. So um, 
so I continued on with Marcy, continued to develop her character. And, um, and so I, I ran with that. I enjoyed her character, so I ran with that for the five-book series. Uh, and then when I decided I wanted to write mysteries as opposed to thrillers, and I see that in my mind there's a bit of a differentiation between the two. Um, can, you, can you tell me I was about thinking of the character. That, that difference? even for the audience i will i, I will uh, just oh. let me uh, finish the oh, thought okay, here okay, about uh, uh so i i i needed a character for the mystery series and um i always liked the mason seaforth character so i reinvented him mm -hmm. as an investigative reporter called jake scott and so he's um uh, so he actually is the the second character from the first book in effect um different name different uh different background and so on. But uh, getting back to your question about the way I differentiate, I see thrillers as being more uh, plot driven and mystery as being more character driven in my mind. That's how I differentiate between the two. Hmm. So, um, uh, but in, you know, in the, in the thriller, there's uh, tension. There's also tension in the mysteries, but uh, I feel that the mystery and the mystery should leave you hanging until the end. So you have to guess or try and figure out who the, the perp is. Whereas the thriller may be more, um, may be clearer at the beginning. You might, you might actually know who the, the bad guy is right up front and, and look at the book from, or the story from two different perspectives, the, the good guy, the bad guy. So uh, that's how I differentiate the two. It, it, it makes sense. I never thought about it <clears throat> from that perspective. But yeah, you're right. Sometimes, uh, even in the movies it itself, that are mostly based on on books, it, you may just see <laughs> who is the guilt, the guilty person or the bad guy uh, right away. Yeah, yeah. You're right. But yeah. you, you're still attached to to the story and the way it develops, and 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 it, it's a different construction. Okay. Absolutely, hmm. and in in a thriller, you may uh, you may develop both characters. You know, so somebody may have an affinity for some aspects of the bad guy, as well. Right. Well, in the mystery, you can't because otherwise you're giving it up. You'd be giving it away. <laughs> it has yeah. to stay. You know, you who's the who is the killer at the table? Uh, exactly. Right. And, and that's part of the fun of uh, creating a mystery is. You know, leaving a couple of clues, subtle clues, uh, misdirection, so that people think that uh, the bad guy is somebody who, who it isn't. Um, mm. And so, you know, there's a certain, there's yeah. a lot of fun in putting that together as well. Yeah, you're, you're, you're building a, a puzzle. Uh, you are. When, you, when, when you're doing that. And I think it takes a certain kind of, certain kind of, uh, of, of mind to to do that um so talking about the mind so a lot of people it's it's kind of like music or any other sort of art even painting i mean whatever you want i mean I, for me storytelling is is everything right every art you're yeah. just using a different medium to to tell your story some people they get comfortable in a certain style in a certain genre and you know and their career is is that that there is nothing else. Others, yeah. they like the challenge. Now, yeah. I'm already seeing in, in what you do that, that you write nonfiction, you write uh, personal experience, like The Missing the Boat or The Adventure on the Kilimanjaro, and yeah. then you jump on this other. How, how do you psychologically and stylistically approach the, when you're writing fiction and when you're writing? Um, emotion and i don't know real life i don't know how to define that i base my characters on uh people that i've met um and or or certain characteristics of people that i met like they could be a con conglomeration of people that that i've met somewhere along the way but i think i maybe i subconsciously study people a little bit mm. and uh kind of collect ideas about different things and, and they're different people. And so that's how I try and put myself in the, in the mindset of the person I'm writing about. And uh, I try and think how 
I would react in the situation that they're in. Not that I would ever want to be in the situation that I put some of them in, but you know, I try and I try and put myself in in their shoes, and uh, and that's how I develop my characters. Is uh, what would I do in that situation, and uh, or that's how I how I develop what they're going to do next, or how they're going to uh, deal with the situation they're in. Mm -hmm. And how does that change when you when you're writing about? Uh, the memoir of your Kilimanjaro ascent. Well, in that case, uh, it, we were writing what we lived. Right, but and, but do you, you know, feel like you're using a different style in, in in writing itself? I mean, do you have to say, okay, th this is not that? You know what I mean? It's y yeah, it is a different style for sure, because um, you have to with the mystery or the thriller, you're creating something. You're you're creating something out of your imagination, and um, whereas uh, whereas with a nonfiction, you're just you know you lived your experience, so you have to you're trying to put that down on paper and explain how you lived and make it interesting enough that somebody's going to read it. Um, whereas with the uh, with fiction, you're you're actually dredging something up from your imagination and and trying to uh, uh, trying to express that. It's a different mindset for sure. It is, for sure. for sure. So I'm gonna I wanna finish and take this last few minutes that we have, like five minutes or so, mm -hmm. in um, maybe giving your perspective and your advice to someone that, you know, like you, get to a certain point on their life and uh, and they wanna start writing. I think a lot of people in the audience are either already writing or they want to become better writers and so you have you have this experience both both life experience and and 10 books after under your belt so what what uh what's your advice about that yeah i get asked that a lot when i'm doing book signings and my initial advice is if you've got a story in your head put it down on paper it doesn't matter you know how good it is or or how bad it is, or, or whatever. Just put it down. Just sit down and write, because that's the the hardest part. I think is to actually start writing and uh, write it, walk away from it, let it simmer for a bit, and then go back and and do your edits or, or look at it and see whether you, you like it, make the changes you think are necessary. Um, I always warn people that marketing you know once you get done the, through the writing process marketing is about 70 percent of the uh of the, the writing process to me the, the actual writing part is about 30 percent and i i find i spend a tremendous amount of time marketing uh on the computer and, and doing a lot of work but my um my primary piece of advice is to sit down and write and, and and let somebody else read it. It doesn't hurt to to get some feedback, and hopefully they'll be honest with uh, with the feedback they're providing. I remember uh, when we first wrote Kilimanjaro and Beyond, and we found uh, an editor. Our, our one of our sons is a musician in Nashville, so um, he's he's got friends who this particular person wrote for Billboard magazine, and so I said I wanted to have a a call with her before she started before she actually started editing but i sent her the book to read and uh she read it and we talked and i said i don't want you just picking up typos and, and grammatical errors you know i want your feedback so we had a conversation and she said you haven't earned the right to preach and what she meant by that was that i had started out uh, advising people on what they could do to climb a mountain then i talked about climbing the mountain and she says, talk about climbing the mountain first, then yeah. talk about um, telling people how they should do it. And it was great advice. It was, right. uh, you know, it was amazing advice. And I flipped everything around and it made for a better book. So uh, the important thing is to to get somebody to read it and, um, and hopefully somebody you can trust to give you uh, critical comments, not necessarily criticism. Like they don't want you to destroy your confidence, but 
you want somebody who's honest and and willing to give you uh, comments that will help you be a better writer. Yeah, I think there is an humbling process in that, and because uh, I don't know, I mean, that one that you describe is definitely kind of like a structural change in the plot, uh, yeah. you know, let's say of the story, and it, it totally makes sense. Some other people may read it, and I feel like nobody read the same book, nobody listen to the right. same song or watch right. the same movie. It's or it's how you interpret things. So I'm sure yeah. that especially in writing, uh, sometimes you hear things that eh, you may not agree with and that you're yeah. not going to change. <laughs> because yeah. if you're going to change everything because somebody tells you you're never going to be done <laughs> and it's not going to be your thing. So um, how, how to, where do you draw a line? Um, you know, I'm sure even like your readers, sometimes they may, you know, with reviews nowadays, everybody is an expert and yeah. everybody has something to say. Um, how do you react to that? Uh, it, in the end, it's your book. Right. That's, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> so, uh, so when I get comments from an editor, I don't necessarily accept them all. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. I don't accept them all. Yeah, and you should. Uh, no, no, I, ac I accept the ones that I feel will make it a better book. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean everything I, I read or see. It's, yeah. it's a lot like getting reviews for your yeah. book. You're going to get positive reviews. You're going to get negative reviews. And that's another piece of advice for aspiring authors is um, don't let the negative review reviews get you down. Yeah, because that can happen, and they're the ones you remember. It's not the positive comments that you remember; it's the negative ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, so I advise people not to take the the reviews or the criticism too seriously. But if there's something there that they feel that can make it a better book, then uh, then listen to it and react accordingly. Yeah, I think is who who is the source of that too? Is that a qualified yes. person? Or, and, and I mean, I, I may be a qualified person that just comment on your post on LinkedIn, uh, and you you got accepted. But a lot of people, you know, it's like when you put out a podcast. I mean, there may be people that like the the way I I carry the conversation, and other people don't. But yeah, in the end, it's my podcast. So yeah, we had uh, <laughs> when we wrote Kilimanjaro and Beyond, we got a literary award one day. Oh. And uh, we were all happy about that. And then there was a re review the same day oh. that was a one-star review and said the, the, the Finleys can't write or something like that. Something oh, like that. Oh, come on. Yeah. And that was that was my first bad review. And my first reaction was to fire back and say, look, we got a literary award. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And my wife told me that maybe I should leave it for 24 hours. <laughs> and so, and she was absolutely right, you know, that uh, – afterwards i just thought it was you know yeah. just somebody had a bad day or something very very wise advice from your yeah. wife I, i've been dealing with branding and content marketing as my you know real job let's say although it is a real job too but uh well yeah when social media came out and <laughs> celebrities and personality get attacked constantly you Taking a breather, don't engage. That's yeah. really, really good advice. And there's yeah. always going to be that bad one, you know? Best Can't hotel in the me. world, five stars on TripAdvisor, but there is that one person that found a spider, uh, you know, on the pillar. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> that's the fault of the hotel management because the spiders sneak in. Well, you know, just I kind was of like going statistic. Through. Remove yep. the too good, remove the too bad, and then yes. stay in the median. As an accountant, yeah. you probably know that. <laughs> I was going through my reviews one day, and I, I don't do that. I, I, now I don't read reviews very much. Mm. Yeah. But I was going through one day, and I noticed somebody had given me a three-star. It said, good book. And so I was curious, you know, <laughs> if it was a good book, why wasn't it four stars or five stars? So I dug a little deeper. And that day... She had given 18 books, a three-star review with the comment, good book. And the wow. day before, she had given 17 books, a three-star review with the comment, good book. So, ch a chance so it wasn't even something that was read by that person. I doubt it very much. <laughs> Why anybody would go, do that, I don't know. But No? 
I had an interesting. No, social media is a is still a mystery to me. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is. It's, it's a psychological mystery. Maybe it's an idea for your next book. It's the some <laughs> kind of mystery of why people troll on the <laughs> on social media. <laughs> if anybody could answer that, they'd be a millionaire. I think. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Listen, I want to I want to end up this with leaving you one minute or thirty seconds, whatever you want to take to introduce your upcoming book, which probably. By the time we publish this, it's either just came out or about to. Um, and it, I know it's the, the third book in, a, in the series that you mentioned before. So uh, if the mic is yours. Okay, thank you. It was, uh, well, it is the third book in the Jake Scott mystery series. In this particular book, uh, Jake is have, has to stay in a bed and breakfast because there's some work being done on his house. So he's coming home and uh, to the bed and breakfast, and a car, car nearly runs him down. And uh, so he picks himself up and continues on to the bed and breakfast. And just before he gets there, the bed and breakfast explodes, killing uh, everybody inside. So he's got a, a love interest who uh, is a homicide detective. She's up to her ears in work. So because Jake is an investi former investigative reporter, she asked him to dig into the background of the people in the bed and breakfast. Uh, when he starts doing that, he finds there are some, there had been some dark things going on at the, the bed and breakfast, which uh, uh, may have resulted in somebody blowing up the, the building. Uh, it's originally thought to be a gas, a gas explosion, but through his investigation, they found out that it could have been more than that. Hmm. So that's the that's the premise in a nutshell of the book. Uh, Jake discovers some secrets that uh, hadn't been uh, hadn't been apparent before, and uh, so that's uh, that's basically the premise of the book. I might add too that uh, I'm working on another book, which is going to be coming out probably in the next couple of months, and I'm writing I'm. Uh, writing the story of a extreme ultra marathoner. She's the third Canadian woman to run across the four deserts. And uh, she swam from Alcatraz to San Francisco. She's done all kinds of extreme sporting things. And um, so it's her biography. It's going to be in her words, but uh, I'm, I'm writing it for her or with her. And uh, so that'll be coming out in the next couple of months. It's called uh, My Limitless Life. And the Jake Scott book is called The Secret Truth. And they'll both be available on Amazon and at your local retailer or library by request. There you go. And uh, everybody knows that in the notes, either YouTube video or the podcast, they can find all the link to your website and therefore... To your books and Amazon, your bio, get in touch with you. Please don't leave a three star review saying it's good because that bear is not gonna like that. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's gonna make him think that's what was wrong with that. Um, no, I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope uh, the audience did. And listen, the, the one you describe about the biography sounds a really beautiful story. If you ever want to come back and talk about that, you want to bring the 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 athlete as well that would be Love a great conversation um i'm yeah. gonna make a note about that because we can have a three uh three people podcast and uh and have a good time i think sure uh, that sounds, sounds good like sounds like a great story so everybody stay tuned barry uh good luck with the new book thank you for thank your you. time and uh everybody subscribe stay tuned and remember we're all made of stories so we're just trying to share them take care <laughs>